In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading for the Sunday of Pentecost is taken from the second chapter of Acts. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is, ta is taken from St. John, the seventh chapter. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church with power, has been compared to a grand opening. That day, when the church moved from being a relatively small group of followers of Christ, about 120 at that point is what the book of Acts tells us a bit earlier. But then through the preaching that takes place through Peter and the apostles, now the church becomes a much larger group made up of thousands who are all baptized into the name of Jesus. Now, as with any grand opening, what you want to do is you want to, you want to time this for a moment when there are lots of people around. And that's why Pentecost, see Pentecost was already an Old Testament celebration. And in the Old Testament, what it was was a harvest festival, kind of like Thanksgiving, only instead of being at the very end of the harvest season, this was a harvest festival that was at the beginning of the harvest season. And in the time of the apostles, it was celebrated in Jerusalem with large crowds of Jewish people gathering there in that city from all over the Roman world where various groups of Jewish people lived. Jewish by ethnicity, Jewish by religion, but perhaps uh, parts of these different countries where they lived. And, and therefore, the language that was their home language was the languages of these different countries that they came from. But at this time, they're all gathered in Jerusalem for this particular festival. And it's with all of these visitors in town, then, 
that the Spirit descends on the disciples and 3,000 new believers are added to the body of Christ that day. <clears throat> Acts tells us that it began around 9 o'clock in the morning. What it actually says is the third hour of the day, and that was the way the, the Romans mark their, their day. But for us, that would be about 9 o'clock in the morning. And that's when this sound like a violent wind comes to the room where the disciples are gathered and tongues of fire set down on each one of the disciples. And this was the gift of the Spirit that Jesus himself had promised was going to come to his disciples. He said he was going to send a helper, a counselor, who would on the one hand bring to mind, to their minds, those things that he had said and done, but this spirit who he said would also convict the world because of sin and righteousness and judgment. And that's what the spirit was doing in a very powerful way through the disciples as they miraculously spoke God's word now in languages that previously they had not known. There's a danger sometimes in the church today of trying to recreate what happened with the apostles on that day of Pentecost. As if somehow we could recreate the event or duplicate what was happening by our own speaking in tongues or perhaps by uh, some other miraculous manifestations of the Spirit. Just a couple of observations about that. First of all, when you read the New Testament, it's very clear that what happened there with the disciples on that day was unique. Now, yes, there are other occasions in the New Testament where you find people speaking in tongues. There are certainly occasions where miracles take place. But nevertheless, even among the apostles, there is never again another day that's quite like this one. And to try to recreate it in the life of the church today is in some sense to miss this grand opening nature of what's actually taking place as the Spirit descends on the apostles. But there's another danger, and this one is actually greater, and that is to focus so much on particular gifts of the Spirit that the Spirit might give to the church, even today, that focus on Jesus is lost. Confidence in the Spirit's presence in our life, the, the, the power of the Spirit, the working of the Spirit, that doesn't come by the presence of wind or, or fire or miraculous speaking in tongues. We are assured that the Spirit works in us through the message about Jesus that brings into our lives real repentance and the assurance that we are forgiven and that works in us a real faith that trusts Jesus. That's where we witness the Spirit's activity among us. That's where Pentecost still happens in the church today. As an illustration to help us think about how the Spirit was at work in the church on that first Pentecost within the church and how we find the Spirit still at work among the church today, consider the energy, the, the power that's contained in, say, five gallons of gasoline. So what can happen with that five gallons of gas is that it could be released in a sudden explosion if someone would, say, drop a lighted match into that gas can. But something else that could happen with that five gallons of gas is that it could be put into a little Honda Civic, the four-cylinder engine that gets 31 miles to the gallon, and it could take that car 155 miles down the road. There's no question that big explosions are certainly spectacular. But the energy that's channeled through a little internal combustion engine, that keeps you moving for the long haul. And what we find out in Scripture, and what we really see in our own lives too, is that the Spirit works in both ways. And at Pentecost, what happens is the Holy Spirit explodes, as it were, on the scene. And you got this violent wind, and you got these flames of fire, and you got this miraculous speaking God's word in all these different languages. But the Spirit also works in the church for the long haul of faith. And so through God's word and in his sacraments, 
what do we find? Christians are given staying power. And even though that may not seem to us to be quite as dramatic, the power is actually still the same. It is still the Spirit at work in people, bringing about repentance, bringing about a conversion, a a new birth, a new life, real transformation as the Spirit works in God's people, sanctifying them. I want you to notice also in chapter 2 that there is a very obvious and strong connection between the work of the Spirit and the proclamation of, of the word of God. So when the Spirit comes on the disciples, what do they do? They begin to speak, it says. They begin to speak about Jesus. Well, it's the Spirit who still moves the church today to speak to the world about Jesus and all that he's done. Pentecost really is about Jesus. It's about preaching Jesus. And so, yes, empowered by the Spirit, but certainly not disconnected from Christ. And Peter specifically makes that point as those who witnessed the preaching of the disciples, in some cases said, these guys must be drunk. And Peter says, no, they're not drunk. He says, what's really happening here is that this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, that even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Peter says. Sometimes when we think about prophecy, what we mainly have in mind is something about foretelling the future. And it's true that oftentimes prophecy does have to do with something about what's coming up in the future, especially we find this in the Old Testament prophetic books, which are foretelling what God is getting ready to do in the New Testament through Christ Jesus. But really prophecy at its heart from the biblical perspective is simply this. It's putting into words here on earth that which God has revealed, that which God has said, that which God has done, or what he's doing, or Again, what he is getting ready to do. Now, the evidence that that's what prophesying is, is simply proclaiming here on earth that which God has said or that which God has done or is doing, is seen in verse 11 when after Peter has said that what they see happening is evidence of this prophecy in Joel, he says, according to verse 11, that these disciples were speaking the mighty works of God. Today in Acts, we only get the very first part of Peter's own sermon explaining what was happening. But if you read on a little bit further into this second chapter, you get the whole content of Peter's prophesying, and you find out it is all focused on Jesus. And it's calling the hearers to repent of their sins, and it's it's calling them to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of those sins. And that, of course, leads Peter, following this admonition, to then call those who have heard to be baptized. And that in their baptism, in the name of Jesus, they'll be forgiven, and that they too, just like the apostles themselves, will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so in that sense, we might say that our baptisms are our day of Pentecost. And every time you and I have the privilege of hearing God's word in our own language, in terms that we can understand, so the Spirit is at work in us, convicting us of our sin and moving us to repent and enabling us to believe, that's Pentecost. And for that matter, every time we receive the Lord's Supper and Holy Communion, these are the means by which the Spirit is at work in our lives to bring to us all those things that Jesus has done to make us his own. So what is it that keeps us from hearing and receiving more eagerly all these gifts that God has given us in Christ? What is it that keeps us from repenting more earnestly What keeps us from believing more firmly? What keeps us from sharing more joyfully the mighty works of God ourselves? Well, it's not the Spirit getting in the way. Now, what gets in the way is our own sinful natures, and they really do. And that's why all throughout Scripture we are warned about this this 
sinful tendency in ourselves to resist the things of the Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we get this admonition from the Apostle Paul. He says, don't quench the Spirit. And he says, don't despise the prophesying. And he says, test everything and hold on to that which is good. Well, the good that you and I want to hear and hold on to today is the truth that the Spirit of God comes to us with power in the message of Christ. And in doing so, what the Spirit is doing is he is breathing new life, transformation into the lives of people just like us. In fact, into us who would otherwise be lost and destroyed because of our sinfulness. There's a story about a man, and his story could really be told millions of different times and in millions of different ways. But in his particular case, the story goes like this, that he was addicted to alcohol. He was a slave to his alcoholism. And it was destroying his life. And it wasn't just destroying his life. It was destroying the lives of those that he loved. But through the hearing of God's word, the Spirit was at work. And over time, as he was convicted by the Spirit, what happened is that he was humbled and he was broken. And he really was finally brought to repent of his sins. And he was enabled by the Spirit to believe that in Jesus... He was forgiven, began to live a new life. And as time went on, this man who had truly become a child of God was challenged once by an acquaintance of his who, who was a skeptic, did not believe the things of Scripture, and who really made fun of him because of his own trust in God's Word. And he says, surely you can't believe all that stuff in the New Testament. You can't really believe that Jesus turned water into wine. Surely you can't believe that Jesus raised the dead to life. And he said, well, sure, I believe that. Because in our house, in our family, I saw him change whiskey into furniture and into food on our table and clothes on our back. And of course, I believe that he raises the dead to life because I was dead and he gave me a whole new life. See, that's what I mean when I say that this story could be told millions of different times and in millions of different ways, because really this is our story, isn't it? One of the things that we find out in this account of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is that the preaching of Christ as Savior is custom fit for everybody's ears. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your past is. On the day of Pentecost, everybody heard. And Acts gives us this whole list, doesn't it? It says, well, there were Parthians and there were Medes and there were Elamites and there's people from Pontus and Phrygia and, and there were Egyptians and there were people from Arabia. And the list just goes on. You know what it also included? People from right there in Jerusalem who less than two months before had themselves called out for the death of Jesus, and for them too, to all of them. P Peter gives the, the, the open proclamation that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. By the way, even that calling on the name of the Lord, well, the Spirit's the one who makes that possible in our lives as well, because he's the one who uses the word to convict us at heart to show us our real need for repentance, to show us the blessing that we have in Christ Jesus, that he does forgive us. He's the one who opens our mouths to confess our sins and to call on the Lord. He's the one who gives us faith that holds fast to Jesus and believes that in him our sins are forgiven. And in all of this, what's he doing? The Spirit at work, making us a part of the Pentecost church that continues to give witness that the death of Jesus is ours. And the life of Jesus is ours. And Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit into our lives as well. In his name, amen. Now may this word keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, you have blessed us in love with a Savior, to whom the nations cry and in whom forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation are given. Grant to us, your Holy Spirit, the Comforter whom you have promised, that we and all who call upon his name shall be saved. Help us to treasure in our hearts your mercy and to give ourselves fully to your service. Almighty God, you have promised the thirsty will drink and from the empty will flow forth rivers of living water. Help us to show forth in holy lives the fruits of the Spirit and to live with love toward our own neighbors. Give us a servant's heart that doesn't seek our own way but walks on the path of eternal life. O Lord, you have promised to make one people from the many. Take from us all pride, prejudice, and hate, that we may not hinder the cause of the gospel by our shame, but give welcome to all people in the name of Christ. Lord of all, you have ordered all things in heaven and on earth. Bless our president, our governor, the Congress of the United States, and all elected and appointed civil servants, that the rule of law may protect the weak and preserve life, and that peace may reign for the benefit of all. O oh Lord, we especially ask these things in light of recent racial, racial divisions and rioting in communities all across our nation. Almighty God, have mercy and spare us. Put an end to the pandemic and restore the communities of the world to their common life. Merciful Father, you carry the burdens of our lives in your hands. Deliver from illness and suffering all who cry out to you for release. Hear us on behalf of the sick and the dying and those who mourn. Especially, we remember among those struggling in their health, Renee Batt, Marjorie Hagedorn, Brianna Hoffman, Jamie Klein, Scott Julian, Lauren Streiner, and Lois Spencer. Answer your people, O Lord, and deliver them from their infirmities and their grief by your grace. Almighty God, hear your people for the sake of him who loved us even to death and who lives to call to himself all who will be saved. You know what we need and those things we should ask in your name. Grant them to us for the sake of our crucified, risen, and ascended Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. In Jesus' name, we also pray as he has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good morning. I want to start immediately in John 7. Jesus cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jews who might have heard these words when Jesus said them uh, would probably think back to, the, to Exodus in the Bible and, and the story of the Israelites. This story that, that is very important in scriptures and that we probably also remember uh, of the Israelites after they left Egypt and they were wandering in the deserts and here they find themselves tired and very, very thirsty. Thirstier than you might be at the halftime of a basketball game. Thirstier than we might be if we had gone to the movies and, and eaten a whole tub of movie theater popcorn with all the salt. Even thirstier than that, they found themselves desperately, dangerously thirsty. But there was no water. And what happens to the Israelites if they don't get any water? Yeah. They die. Oh, but God takes care of his children. He made water flow from a rock and they lived. So today when Jesus says, come to me and drink, he is once again our rock. And he gives us the water of life. 
But this water doesn't just quench our thirst. No, it, it quenches death. Jesus gives us the water of eternal life. There's one more thing I want to point out about the scripture. God's living water, the water that gives us life both today and forever, can flow from us. Well, how is that? How can we possibly give living water to anyone? That's what Jesus does. Well, we can do it because God helps us. God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which, which works in us so that we can learn about God's word and then share that word with those around us. You could even say that it flows through us. Today, we celebrate that God gives us the Holy Spirit so that his word can flow through us and into the world around us. Will you pray with me? Say, dear God, thank you for Jesus. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.